Right, uh, I'll, do, oh, right, I'll just switch myself off. Uh, okay, right. Well, good evening and um, thank you for turning up and thank you very much for the, um, for the invitation to, to talk to you about this project. Um, first of all, I would like to do some, some other thank yous. Um, there's a number of people who've been quite heavily involved in this project and getting it off the ground. Um, Jason Wood, um, who's the kind of the, the, the project director, um, he's done an enormous amount. He has a, a massive amount of knowledge about leisure heritage. He wrote an excellent book on Bradford Park Avenue, and he's been kind of at the fore of... Um, moves to try and get leisure heritage and the kind of the heritage of the everyday kind of better understood. I mean, he he led um, a campaign um, almost single handedly to have Blackpool uh, recognised as a world heritage site because of the way that it shaped um, holiday activity. He was also kind of really important in trying to get greater recognition for for horse racing as a kind of as a heritage activity so jason is kind of very closely involved in this project he really runs this project and uh, it wouldn't have got anywhere as far as it has um, without him i also want to thank tony cole um, who has uh, become a very close <coughs> friend of mine he's an absolutely brilliant um photographer committed passionate fan of, um, of York City, all of the good black and white photographs that you'll see in this presentation are by Tony, are by Tony, and he very kindly gave me uh, gave me permission to kind of to use them uh, in this presentation. The other thing about Tony <clears throat> is that he is annoyingly articulate, and he is one of those people who I just. If we have people from the, the press or other media outlets, I say, oh, you need to go and talk to Tony Cole. And he always does these most brilliant um, interviews and presentations. So he's you know, just worth his waiting gold, is Tony Cole. Ian McAndrew, from the, one of the, the directors of York City, he, I've known him for some time. And he is one of the, he was the only director who kind of, who got what it is we were that Historic England was trying to do, and he was able to convince the other directors that Historic England weren't some awful Stalinist threat to the to the club, and that you know we could be accommodated. So, so Ian's been a really great help. Obviously, the the club itself, the, the York City fans, the supporters club, and the CBA have actually been absolutely brilliant as well for their kind of great enthusiasm for the project. There have been two articles in the CBA magazine about, um, about Booth and Crescent, so I'm very grateful to them as well. Why, why Historic England and Booth and Crescent and why football? <clears throat> the, there's a number of things going on, a lot of things happening in heritage management and cultural heritage studies, um, certainly over the past 20 years or so. Um, not all of it is in the kind of the the public domain and not all of not all heritage managers agree with what's being said so the kind of that i kind of i think i've boiled it down to three things three reasons why it's so the first one is the idea of what heritage is is changing so people have become to some people have be, become better at realizing that heritage is something dynamic it's about the mix of place and memory history, uh, story, a multiplicity of meanings, links, associations, uh, the intangible, the ordinary. And heritage is something that's, that's made in the present. Now, one of the, uh, the most well-known kind of commentators on uh, critical heritage studies, Laura Jane Smith, um, was always very clear in saying that heritage is a verb, it's not a noun, it's, it is a process, it's something that we create. And it's about how we use the past in the present. And for me, and for this new idea of what heritage is, it's not about old fabric. It's not about preservation, attribution, connoisseurship, elite values, and all of those kind of things that have been handed down to us since the, the, the middle of the 19th century. 
heritage is something completely different. Now, the second thing is that Historic England as an organization has become more interested in place and place making. And this kind of begs the question that if heritage is no longer solely about fabric, how do you use a new interpretation of heritage to make a new place? So, you know, how do you give physicality to memory and associations? Now, as an organization, we get, because we're a heritage organization, we get a lot of um, inquiries from the public about about the buildings they love. And usually the buildings they love aren't designated buildings. They're not listed buildings. So people kind of write to us, email us to say, we're losing our cinema, we're losing our theater, we're losing our concert venue. And what can you do to help us? And the, the sad thing is that there's actually very little that we can do. So one of the things that I'd, I'd wanted to do with this project was to, to see how you can record a place or understand a place, a kind of a leisure heritage place, and then make some sort of template or a kind of a format to give to people to say, well, this is what we did at Booth and Crescent. This is what succeeded hand it over to them and say, and you can apply this to your, to the place that you value. So for example, there's a, a huge debate online at the moment about the loss, the possible loss of the lead mill uh, music uh, venue in Sheffield. And, it, and I do get in touch with them every so often to say, you know, have a look at what we're doing at Booth and Crescent, if the worst comes to worth at lead mill and see if that would help. If, you know, as I say, if the worst comes to the worst, but maybe, it, hopefully, it won't. Now, the third thing is inclusion and diversity. Um, so as we have a new idea of what heritage might be, we have a better understanding of what and who have been admitted from our stories. The stress on preservation and old fabric kind of privilege the idea of uh, a national story that somehow the past was safe, consensual, um, objective, and kind of back there in the past. But the reality is actually very different. And that approach kind of excised numerous people and interests. So heritage is, in my way of thinking, heritage is political, it is subjective, and it is contested. So the social theorist Stuart Hall said that heritage was like a mirror. And if you couldn't see yourself reflected in that mirror, it was akin to being told that you had no place and no stake in society. Now, although I'm terribly middle class now and live in Poppleton, my, my background is working class. My father was the general secretary of a print trades union in Manchester, and the house we lived in was owned by the trades union. And for me, the big kind of omission in heritage is, is that of the heritage of working people and communities. And I remember when I first joined English Heritage and kind of joined the inspectorate, I was kind of standing apart from a conversation between two specialists, and they were debating what were the greatest cultural achievements in Britain and one said oh it's perpendicular architecture and the other said no it's kind of um, it's designed landscapes and I was standing there thinking well what about fish and chips or pork pies or Stilton or um, rugby league or football or any of those things and I and I really did feel that I could see that I was going to have a battle on my hands so all these ideas and changes were kind of swirling around in my mind and I needed a way to think them through. And for me, the Bootham, for me, the Bootham Crescent project is a way of actually kind of thinking this stuff through, but thinking it by, by doing. And, and initially what I did is I kind of proposed a project, I put together a project brief, and I put it to our uh, commissioning team to say, this is what I'm thinking of. And they got back in touch with me and said, it's rubbish. And that, and I kind of kept going for four years. And then as we got more and more interested in the idea of place and placemaking, 
uh, I rewrote it and I just sprinkled the same project brief with the words um, place and placemaking and they got back in touch with me and said this is absolutely brilliant idea we should be doing more of this and I have to say that um, the, the commission's team have been absolutely fantastic they backed me all the way and they've kind of they've been really pleased by the results from this project so this is it it's keeping your shape and I'll kind of dis I'll explain about all the, the stickiness as we go on. <clears throat> so this is the aim of the project. I try to have one aim. Um, so using the example of the redevelopment of Brewing Crescent, show how you, know, you can use these new ideas of cultural heritage to make a new distinctive place. And it has a set of objectives kind of attached to it. Um, so it was initially about recording the final season of, of football at Booth and Crescent, and that seemed to be um, a really interesting and easy thing to do. But of course, we hadn't counted for, for COVID and the we'd known for some time, well, everybody had known for some time that um, York City were going to uh, move from Booth and Crescent to a new out of town ground. Um, interestingly enough, they started in 1922 at an out of town ground at Fulford Gate, moved into Booth and Crescent, will now be moving out. So there's a sort of circularity there. Um, and it was also <clears throat> about the match recording, the match day experience as well. It's not just it's not just the match, it's the whole thing about getting kind of ready in the morning, meeting your mates, going to the same, going to the same shop, the same pub, and then kind of thinking about the game, getting ready for the game, enjoying the game, meeting friends, people that you, you perhaps only meet uh, at the at the grounds, maybe at away matches as well, and then you know going back after the match, going home, going to the pub, all of those things. So it, it was the match day experience. Um, Ian McAndrew was in the kind of discussions that we had, and I say he kind of really understood what it was that we were trying to do with this project. So, you know, how, how you, you kind of collect all the ideas of, about the place, all the associations, all the meanings, and then you have this discussion between the club, the fans, uh, the developer, the local authority, and see how you can kind of make that memory physical. And um, Ian came up with this lovely phrase at, at one meeting and say what he wanted to do was to give fans the opportunity to say goodbye properly to the ground. And for some people, kind of losing Booth and Crescent was akin to, akin to a death. Um, people took it very, very hard on the allotments that I have the allotment I have in, in Poppleton, the guy on the allotment next to mine, he told me that he's already told his granddaughters where he wants his ashes scattered on the ground. And people, you know, are so deeply, deeply committed to it. And as, this, as it says on the kind of the second from bottom, and what again, what I was, and what, I hinted, what I've hinted at before is I wanted to be able to kind of develop a methodology so to apply to other lost leisure heritage places and the idea of making it sticky is that I was aware that historic England couldn't do everything and it wasn't right that we would try and do everything as well I wanted to kind of create a framework of a, a project so that, that would then get kind of in, get people enthusiastic about it and they would then come up with their own projects to attach to this kind of, if you like, the, the core project, and they could go with it in whichever direction they wanted. I'm, you know, to extent that's that's what I want. Um, it's for them to decide. And it was very kind of clear to me that um, if the fan base didn't want to do the things that I was suggesting, then I just wouldn't do them. It was going to be their their choice. And initially, there was some reservation about whether you know why historic england was getting involved you know this this organization that deals in ruined castles abbeys listed buildings and all of that carry on why they were interested or why they should be interested in football and what football fans thought <clears throat> obviously here's here's the ground itself You've got, here's the ground here it's just outside <clears throat> 
the Central Historic Core Conservation Area. So the development there, the development of the ground might have had an impact on the, 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 the significance of the conservation area. And you can see that the thing about kind of um, the location, the setting is that it is every day. It is still, you know, it is still a very working class context. Um, I wouldn't say that class is the last taboo in heritage management, but it sometimes feels like that. And to actually kind of talk, I mean, again, to me, it was important to, to talk about it. And the interesting things came out of the start of the discussions of the people who run the pub that you see in the, in the bottom right, they were talking about what's going to happen to them when the ground moves, how they kind of maintain their links to that, to that match day experience. So as the project started to, to develop, people gained confidence in what we were doing and wanted to, to talk to us and actually kind of share their, their feelings and their kind of, kind of aspirations and you know, their, their utter sadness at, at, at losing, losing the ground. So part of its attraction for me was that it was every day, but it's this every day that has these kind of amazing connections and, and layers of, of meaning. And what we had to do was to think about um, sort of how, you know, in very kind of simple terms, as, as, as I was kind of uh, trained as an archeologist, how we record the ground. But then <clears throat> obviously, so we did a geophysical survey, we did laser survey, and then we started to think about how we needed to do an audit of the ground to actually kind of understand um, what, um, how the ground was was made up, kind of what the stories were there. So, for example, what you can see in the uh, the photograph on the right hand side of the of the ground, on the uh, the left hand side, you have the popular stand. Your sta where the photograph is taken from the away end, you're looking down to the home end, <clears throat> and the the barriers that you can see, uh, the red barriers that you can see at the way end, just kind of in front of the uh, the camera. Once you start to kind of look in detail, you start to you do start to to kind of notice things, and the the barriers are made of old railway uh, tracks, railway sort of lines, and which is perhaps no surprise for for York being um, uh, a railway town. And so some of these kind of small, kind of really interesting facts about the kind of the the origins of the club and the way that it was put together, the way the ground was put together. Uh, started to emerge. And the idea of doing the audit was that um, we kind of knew that that people would, would you know, it's certainly true of kind of any other grounds, football ground, rugby league ground, cricket ground that's been lost, is that on the final day, people descend on it and they just tear it apart. They, they all want their memento. So we wanted to make sure that we had a really good understanding of what was there, what could be sold, what could be auctioned and what people might want. Um, and we kind of thought of, thought that through in terms of you know should every new house on this on the development site have a tile from the floor of the changing room something like that. so there'd be some um, sort of way of kind of representing the ground in each individual property you know would the house numbers be made up of um, again kind of the bricks from the, the original bricks from the ground all of those things all those ideas kind of started to to come through. And sort of the kind of they became more aware of the um, the other kind of stories that were going on. So uh, in the top uh, left with the, the the timber seating, I mean that is some of the only timber seating, original timber seating that's left in the country, and a lot of that was was going to go to the uh, to the National Football Museum in Preston. The the red plastic seating, um, all of that came from Main Road, Manchester City's ground, um, when, that, uh, when that was lost. Uh, but all of that is going to, has either been kind of sold off individually or it's actually going to other football grounds. It's all going to be recycled. Quite a few people kind of bought um, sections of the, of the wooden seating as well. And I've kind of got bits of wooden seating uh, in the house. The, the kind of the, um, 
the, the dugouts, as I understand it, kind of the home and away dugouts, they were paid for by Sir Alex Ferguson. And, um, and, and so they, again, they all have kind of layers of meaning. The, the, most, the most kind of everyday thing has these kind of layers of meaning that were kind of really important to people and that kind of needed to be explored. Uh, the popular stand is so called because it was um, kind of paid for by by the fans. Um, the York City moved to Booth and Crescent in 1932, and um, uh, the ground kind of developed over time. And what you can see is there's the popular stand on the left hand side, and on the right hand side, that kind of photograph shows. Uh, the tunnel that runs at the back of the popular stand. It runs right the way along the back of the popular stand. And again, this was the only kind of surviving example of such a thing. Um, and it actually served as an air raid shelter during the, the Second World War. But its function was kind of a bit more interesting as well in that the idea of having a home end and an away end is actually a relatively new idea in football. And what would happen is that the fans would exchange change ends at half time. So at, at York City, then you would kind of walk, uh, you know, the, the fans would kind of pass each other in this tunnel. And, you know, there'd be the occasional, um, you know, hot word spoken between people, the occasional little bit of um, handbags. But it was a really interesting survival and interesting kind of aspect of uh, football that people have perhaps forgotten. And the kind of the idea for the for the ground, for what's left of the ground, is that there will be a section of the popular terrace without its roof that will be retained as a place of kind of, of memory. And with many football grounds and kind of rugby grounds, P fans you know, deceased fans have, you know, they've had their ashes spread on the ground, they've had their ashes buried at the ground. Lots of football grounds have been, uh, have been converted um, to, out, to, you know, to shopping centres, to housing estates, all those sorts of things. And nobody has really given any thought to, you know, the people who were, who had their ashes buried there or had their ashes scattered there. So one of the things that, that was done, and I'll, I'll come have more photographs of this later, and it, this was kind of the initiative of, of the club rather than the Historic England project, was that they were trying to go public and ask people to come forward to, you know, if they had given, if they, they knew where ashes were, were buried at, at the ground. And those ashes would be, would be dug up, um, there would be cores taken of the turf um, where lots of ashes were scattered and then they would be taken to this kind of the, this new part of the of the ground that would this retained terrace and there would be a kind of a garden of remembrance that would be set up around it focused on the halfway line and the center spot and the, the other thing about doing the different types of survey was what we started to realize just how much of all of that could generate income for for the club and can be you know it can be turned into apps so that you would sit on the on the, the terrace uh, you would be able to kind of look at um you'd be able to look at past football matches you would be able to see the information that we've kind of gathered about the site um but you would also be able to do things like um we recorded every seat type at the ground so that if you weren't able to have your own seat or get a seat you might then you know be able to get one sort of uh, digitally or have it 3d printed so you can have it any scale you can have it at, at one to one you could have it as a, as a key ring as a snow dome all of those things so all of that kind of digital material was amassed to enable the, to allow the club to kind of do as many things and allow the fans to do as many things as they wanted with that information and that data to do something kind of really interesting should they want to. <clears throat> so Simon Holmes is the, um, the developer. And I mean, they took some convincing uh, about the project. So you have here sort of two um, uh, two approaches to how the ground is to be was to be set out that on the left in color was their first um idea 
and then we kind of argued with them about they needed to change the orientation of the housing to make it better reflect the orientation of the ground and the public open space and the um and its kind of relationship to the center spot and to things like um getting them to retain things like uh, the five minute flag which was kind of which was at match day was down in this corner here and the idea of the five minute flag is that it was something that was um in the days before people sort of sort of commonly had uh, pocket watches what would happen is that five minutes before the end of the match the flag would be would be lowered and people so the people would know there were only five minutes to go so that you know they they knew what time it was in relation to getting their last bus home or their last train home and they could leave the ground if they wanted or people could come in for for free for the last five minutes so having kind of got them to change the kind of the orientation of the ground of the of the development scheme they then became kind of more comfortable about retaining things like the five minute flag and obviously for something like uh, housing development having a, a big flagpole there is um would be a real benefit to them and we were able to argue that we'd looked at other uh cases where football grounds had been developed to actually say that you know that that they were extremely popular not least with with football fans themselves who would buy property there and they you know they were sold at, at a premium and and you know they eventually kind of listened to that argument and uh, were kind of you know were convinced by it i mean we still have to you know we still have to argue with them and debate them uh, but it has got easier now the archaeology now that this is something as i said this was something that was really um pushed by by the club and it was kind of it was kind of all around the idea of getting members of the public uh involved in the club and to come forward and say that whether they had kind of they'd kind of buried uh the ashes of, of relatives at the ground and whether they could identify the locations of those ashes more often than not the, the the locations kind of identified were along the the end of the uh, at the at the home end along the goal line or just behind the goal line or uh, around the kind of the center spot and at the the popular stand um side of the uh, of the halfway line and so pe pe people came they came to see if they could remember the locations of where people were buried and then some people as well i mean they were extremely extremely interested and you know they live in york so a place where kind of archaeology is talked about a lot but perhaps they didn't necessarily think that archaeology was something for them but actually then being involved in actually the physical recovery of people, of the remains of people they never thought they were going to recover, was actually something that became extraordinarily emotionally charged. I mean, not surprising. And it was, you know, it, it's, you know emotionally charging for them and for the archaeologists. You know, and again, they were largely all volunteers. We had students who came. One person came from, I think, from Nottingham, thought she was going to be excavating on a Roman villa and found herself kind of excavating um, a 1960s um, uh, sort of uh, uh, a 1960s feature. But people took it, took to it really well because it, it was something that was so different. And it was this idea of something that, again, that was so different as an archaeologist, you would never imagine that you would be excavating uh to recover a cremation with the the sister or brother or father of that person actually standing behind you looking over your shoulder as you were doing so and the thing is it was done dealt with in an extremely sensitive manner and people as i said were very moved by it very emotionally moved by it and there were some people who said you know well i've i've recovered my my sister or my brother and you know, i'll help you recover your family member as well and and they got involved they got really heavily involved and it was actually quite wonderful to experience but then there was a kind of the the kind of the archaeology of it kind of grew as well so for example so the little kind of the spike that you can see in the ground there kind of in the in the foreground that is one of the hooks that that held the the back of the net of the football net the goal in place 
and they found obviously the remains of the goalposts. Uh, but they also found the fact that, so you've got the, the most recent goalposts here and here. But what they also found was that you've got goalposts here and down here. And what was hap what's happened over time is that the goalposts really have shifted. And what we suspect has happened is that the goalposts or the goals were kind of moved slowly towards the popular stand. And that's because the... Uh, the, the the kind of the oh, I've got the name of the other stand the other stand actually opposite the uh, the popular stand that had uh, lo lower tiers of seating attached to it which there which then kind of pushed the ground towards towards the um, towards the west towards the popular stand so the goalposts actually moved over time we also discovered that the the white the continued kind of white lining of the ground actually survived as an archaeological feature. So that is, so this here is one period of white lining of the ground. And there's another one kind of back here that is the very first ground in 1932. Over in this sort of uh, picture over here, you can see there's what there's a kind of uh, the remains of the, the seating for the, um, uh, for one of the goalposts, the early goalposts, and a number of coins and, and hooks. And again, these, these coins, we kind of wondered for some time what, it was, what was going on here. And when we kind of spoke to a number of the, the fans, what they said was, certainly the older fans, they said, you know, what was important is that half time you would have four people walking around the ground, each holding a corner of a huge um, bed sheet, and people in the stands would throw money into the bed sheet. And, it, and we suspect this is the kind of the money that didn't make it into the into the bed sheet. This is some of the re recovery of the um, of the cremated remains. Um, again, it was a very difficult thing to do in that. Um, the, the site uh, had several types of geophysics done to it, uh, which was like off, ge geophysics often are. It's, you know, there was um, some questions, sort of inconclusive in parts. And what had happened is that although people came to the ground with ashes in urns, quite often what they did was that they, they might, have, might have had a plastic urn, so it wouldn't have been kind of discoverable through geophysics. But also kind of what people did, the groundsman would have dug the hole at the place that was kind of sort of that, that people wanted. And then some of the ashes were then emptied out into a into a carrier bag and put in the hole and the rest taken home. So and then kind of you know put somewhere else. So it was it was actually kind of um, a really interesting example of kind of how people treated um, buried remains but it did make the archaeology a lot more complex and people had to be that much more kind of sensitive to the to the situation which was you know which was entirely entirely appropriate <clears throat> one of the things that people that i get asked most often um about uh, archaeology and sites is how do places get buried and the and the actual sort of the loss of uh, Bootham Crescent has been a really good, and recording the loss of Bootham Crescent has been a really good way of being able to talk to people about a site they know, to actually to talk to them about how it is being lost, how it is being buried, to then be, you know, to talk about how sites further back in time have become lost and buried. And it also kind of gives us the opportunity to think about kind of sport and leisure in in other historic periods i mean were the kind of the emotions the same when pe did people think the same way and it's been it has been really interesting to um to kind of use this as as an example to 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 talk about how sites are lost and and buried the kind of the the way that the 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 buddleia has kind of taken over the the ground because uh, there was quite a long period before when the kind of the last match happened and before the demolition started when you could actually just kind of watch and we recorded the ground kind of starting to to disintegrate which was kind of a really kind of interesting experience 
but the kind of the sticky initiatives. There were kind of a lot of ideas that came forward. There was going to be um, a documentary done about Bootham Crescent as a place of work that was going to be done by the University of York uh, Department for Film, uh, Theatre and Television. Uh, it may still be done, um, but at, it was proposed exactly at the time when when the first kind of COVID started in March 2020 and we had to kind of pull the plug on it and the idea of the project was to record the people who worked there you know who was the person who, who was first opened up the ground who was the person who you know interviewed the person who took the money that allowed you to go from one part of the ground to another interviewing the people who sold the food so it was all about Booth and Crescent as a place of work Historic England has been producing a number of uh, documentaries and, and videos. Um, they're available on the Historic England uh, YouTube site, Sharing Memories, Shaping Place. Um, there'll be there's six or seven at the moment. There'll be uh, a few more to come. A lot of work is being done on kind of Alzheimer's initiatives um, through footballing memories. And again, this is something that we we feel we can kind of contribute to and, and, they can, and the footballing memories groups can borrow from, uh, borrow material from us. I've mentioned about the, the, the audit for, for auction, for art and, and reuse. Um, Tony Cole has, um, he has, kind of producing his first book, kind of Home End, really kind of before the project started, his kind of black and white photographs to actually record the experience of being a fan. And again, his second book kind of happened at the time of um, kind of when the project started kind of going away, being about the experience of, a, of, of being an away fan. And I, I, I think there'll probably be, be two more books of, of uh, black and white photography because he's been very closely involved in recording the 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 end of, of Booth and Crescent. There was a very good article in When Saturday Comes. There's been several articles now um, in The Guardian uh, about Booth and Crescent. We've you know we've built up a really good relationship with the with the Guardian kind of football correspondence. Um, there's kind of different sort of proposals coming forward for, for lottery grants and Arts Council England grants as well. And then people learning from the experience of, of Booth and Crescent about how fans can get involved in celebrating their, their, their grounds, their lost grounds. So there's a, perhaps a project going to come forward about doing some archaeological work at Ayrson Park, the lost football ground at, um, in, in Middlesbrough, which bizarrely enough is one of the, um, the only uh, national heritage monument uh, outside. It's a North Korean national heritage monument, and it's the only North Korean national heritage monument outside of North Korea. And that's because uh, Ayrson Park, North Korea beat Italy 1-0 in the 66th World Cup. And as a result of that, um, Ayrson Park was declared a national heritage site and quite often you get uh, sort of dignitaries from North Korea visiting Middlesbrough. Lincoln City and Luton Town are kind of are will be looking to move the ground um, as are Castleford Tigers, there's a cinema in Redka. So all of these places can you know kind of learn from kind of what we've done at Booth and Crescent. And going back to this thing about the template, kind of the methodology, and what, what do we need in, in this toolkit? So we, we think we've been able to boil it down to a few things. So there's having a focal point for memory, getting the orientation of the new development right, and that's kind of reflect goes back to what I was saying about the discussions with um, the developer about shifting the buildings, retaining some elements of the fabric, but also that means allowing the public, allowing the fans to retain some element of the fabric, getting the timing right. And the thing is you can do this sort of project at any, we think that any time in the trajectory of a building. It's also really interesting to think about how we transfer meaning and understanding to the, to the new place, to the new location. And that's something that perhaps the, the people uh, sort of attending here today kind of might be able to comment on. So, how do we how do you make the the NMR uh, the, the the new ground sort of um, 
a place that you want to celebrate. The, the site that's retained, it must have meaning and you must be able to understand it. So that, you know, it's actually being able to, um, it has an integrity, it has to have an integrity to it. And getting people to understand and appreciate that they are kind of heritage makers themselves. Heritage isn't something that's kind of done to them by, by professionals. I mean, they are kind of part of making heritage and getting people to kind of to understand that and actually then be kind of really active and willing participants and take control of themselves is, is really important to me. Now, I'm just going to conclude I said, there, I said there's been quite a few articles in The Guardian, and there was one very recently, um, this one here, because I bought a York City turnstile at auction, it's the best £300 I've spent, and what I've just kind of left here um, is, is the final um, two paragraphs of, of this article, it's actually a brilliantly written article, and I'd in, certainly encourage you to kind of go and find it online, it, it, it's beautiful, it's brilliant, it says everything that I've kind of wanted to say in a much more articulate and eloquent way, so I'll just give you um, a, a couple of minutes to read this, and let you think about it, what it's, what it's trying to say, because it really gets it for me. He absolutely nails it. And one of the things I've kind of really been keen about is, under, is being, I don't think we do enough about understanding loss and decay. And loss and decay actually kind of releases other values, other meanings, and releases kind of other creative values and meanings. And we don't, we just don't do enough of it. And again, part of the kind of my thinking behind the project was to kind of explore the values behind the underpin kind of loss and decay. So I think what I'll do is if I stop sharing this, and if I just, I, I just see if I can find this photograph, sorry, that, um, that I thought I had captured. Oh, here it is. <clears throat> so just very quickly, um, I was at Booth and Crescent earlier in, in the week, and there's been a steady stream of people just turning up to the ground, fans, football fans who who want something and they're really happy just to have a brick from the 1930s building and this guy was so pleased to have his 1930s brick it was just brilliant and I had to take a photograph of him and it kind of really captured that kind of sense that's in the article so I'll stop there I'll stop sharing and I'll stop there so thank you very much Thanks very much, Keith. Um, I'm sure everyone is clapping um, in their own in their own homes. Um, people are very welcome uh, to switch their cameras on now for the Q and A portion of the seminar. Um, we've had some fantastic contributions um, of uh, members of the. Um, York Football Club community, I think, York City community um, in the chat, um, some great sort of historical uh, contributions. I don't know if you uh, want to have a flick through those, Keith, as um, people are contributing their questions. Um, please do feel free either to pop your question in the chat, um, or if you would like to ask a question, um, you can do so um by using the um, raise hand function or simply by um unmuting yourself and speaking if you prefer that method <laughs> 